low lovely people who I cannot be with. Um, I am still getting the hang of doing lectures by Zoom. And uh, I thought I would try to break things up so that you don't have to listen for too long and make this a bit of a lecture workshop, which is a genre I've been experimenting with. And I'm gonna share with you some of the writing that has come out of my public feelings group, which thanks to Zoom has been able to gather um, in various spots. I'm here in Ottawa, Canada, but my um, home base peeps are in Austin, Texas, and we've had some other guests. And we have miraculously managed to get together once a month. Um, so it's been a very interesting way to document um, how we're feeling during this time. Um, I have also made use of the work of Linda Berry. Um, she published a really interesting piece in the New York Times that was called uh, Under the Rubric. I'm not going to do screen share, but I think the link is going to be available to you as part of this post. But if you just want to Google while I'm talking, um, it's called Documenting All the Small Things That Are Easily Lost, which I think is um, a great title. And it's um, instructions for how to document um, or how to create your pandemic diary in a combination of images and words. And she begins from the prompt, how did then become now? Um, and one of her tools is um, to make lists in response to the prompts and then to write. But for purposes of this exercise, she also introduced something that I found really useful, which is the spiral. So uh, while I'm talking, you may want to spiral. So get out paper and pen. I'm going to pause the video or you can pause to get go get stuff. Um, so I use these pens. Here's an example of one of my spirals. Um, this was on the history of death in five sentences. Um, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm gonna do four segments. I'm gonna change uh, at least my clothing, if not the background, so you'll know, and you can hang out for all four, or you can um, watch one or two, come back. So that way, um, ideally, this won't be too long, or you have um, the option to keep it relatively short. Um, so the first prompt, uh, is um, pandemic keywords. I'm sure you have um, heard many of them, thought about many of them, things like uh, sheltering in place, uh, social distancing, flattening the curve, etc. cetera. Um, you might also want to think about pandemic feelings. We are here today under the rubric of mass hysteria and um, the poster for the event also features some different feeling words, um, panic, hoax, fear, crisis, fake, lie. Uh, I'm sure your list could go on. So be thinking about pandemic feelings, how are we feeling, and uh, pandemic keywords. So my keyword is um, COVID silver linings, something that I've been thinking a lot about as that circulates. Um, so here's what I came up with, and this was written at the beginning of April. So in the first um, month of pandemic time, or what I like to call it, the time of Miss Rona. Um, all right, COVID silver linings has rapidly become a new meme or hashtag and is directly related to my work on dialectics of hope and despair, pessimism and optimism, positive and negative affects. The phrase also takes me back to Marx's thinking about capitalism as sowing the seeds or the viruses of its own destruction and bringing into being possibilities for liberation. For him specifically, the conditions of factory production brought workers together in ways that could enable gatherings for purposes of political revolt, such as unions and strikes. Even without the new protocols of social distancing, that version of public gathering seems to have withered considerably under current regimes, although there are some persistent traces here in Canada where unions do exist. Another good example would be John D'Amelio's hypothesis about capitalism and gay identity and how urban settlements and war enabled people to leave their families and circulate in new and different ways that allowed more flexible intimacies such as same-sex cruising and cohabitation. 
It's interesting that capitalism's socialist silver lining has to do with people gathering together to create publics of various kinds, including intimate and affective ones. How might the COVID silver lining that is a function of social distance be not just about alternate socialities, but also about the asocial or antisocial, the retreat, the withdrawal, and even the refusal or rejection? Hashtag Together Apart also seems to be making the rounds in this vein, with emphasis on the together in spite of being apart, injecting a hopeful note. But I'm reminded of Douglas Crimp's formulation coming together to stay apart, which, which retains a bit more of the antisocial spirit in describing cultural formations that include isolation or separation. It comes from the big queer debate about the antisocial, where Bersani and Edelman got lined up against Mignos and Halberstam, with Berlant perhaps somewhere in between, or dialectically transcendent above all. As those who might be struggling with new forms of domesticity, especially it seems to me the parents left home alone with the kids and also trying to work, the dream of one big happy family actually includes plenty of trouble and bad shit between us, especially in our most intimate relations, as the critique of compulsory heterosexuality or the stats on a current rise in domestic violence would confirm. So together apart, like COVID silver linings, needs to cut both ways and retain the aura or specter of negativity. For me personally, with the privileges of a salaried job that is not in jeopardy, existing home office and no kids, COVID silver linings is a real thing. I'm so happy to be working at home, especially after months of the forced march of the nine to five in my current admin job. Even though I'm actually, I feel obliged to show up, even though I'm actually far less productive in the office and waste a lot of time on the labor of commuting, which includes not only the time spent getting there, but the time spent getting dressed, packing lunch, leaving the house um, in order, etc. This is where this importance of documenting small things is um, crucial at all times, but especially now. I really hate it going to the office. Um, and one reason I got into the academic biz was to avoid it, especially because I'm now back in Canada. I'm reminded of the dreary routines of childhood. And I wonder if the negative associations have to do with Toronto winters or being a latchkey kid or other low level forms of feeling bad or depression. Even if we are aware of the class privileges of um, hashtag WFH working from home as a COVID silver lining and the class and racial critiques are quickly emerging. I still want to go on record as saying that the step back from ordinary routines of work and workaholism have been a welcome break and an important form of refusal for me. I've also been thinking about COVID silver linings at a more meta theoretical level in terms of the dialectics of the positive and negative. Is our need to find a, a silver lining, a form of cruel optimism to invoke Lauren Berlant? Is it like the pink ribbon culture of warriors and survivors that surrounds cancer treatment in the US? Part of the American need to put a happy face on everything. As we know from our public feelings and field tank explorations, the shared collectivity of political depression, for example, is forged out of impasse, numbness, and despair. At the same time, it has been important in recent weeks to forge resources of hope, which include the creative activities and the resting that I have seen. Also the spiral drawing. Um, these are some interesting strategies of survival and resilience and working together that qualify as COVID silver linings. Indeed, there is an optimism in the belief that social distancing will make a difference and adherence to it is dependent on staving off the seductive pull of the death drive of risky behavior that I am familiar with from HIV AIDS activisms, an important backstory for public feelings work. We refuse to pathologize those who engage in risky behaviors. While we might develop strategies for safer social distancing, like we did for safer sex, we also know that some will be less compliant, quote unquote, uh, due to despair, addiction, lack of economic and material resource. And still the queer utopian in me 
wants to see the gay choreographers put in charge of the dance of social distancing as we figure out new ways to move together in space with our gloves and our masks, taking on as our partner, Miss Rona, with her fabulous red clusters and crowns. Okay, that's it for that one. I'm going to pause. You can choose to write about your pandemic keywords for a few minutes before moving on to the next episode, um, or you can just zoom right along. All right, I'm going to pause. Okay, folks, we're back. Um, I changed the background and my outfit so you'll know that we're in a different episode. I uh, hope you had a chance to do a little writing. And um, this time, next, this assignment is performance in a time of Miss Rona. So <clears throat> I'm sure you, like I, have been attending events um, via Zoom and other mechanisms. Uh, this one was written a month later, so at the beginning of May 2020. Um, and by that time, I had already seen a lot of stuff and was keeping, keeping records. So here's some little pop summaries, reviews of what I saw. Um, would love to know about what you saw. For me, um, being able to attend some version of performance, uh, but thinking about what it meant to have it be mediated and not live has been a real lifeline. Okay, so performance in a time of Miss Rona. Um, in March, Justin Vivian Bond as Auntie Glam on Instagram TV, and Paul Swallow as Christine and Rebecca Havemeyer also in Instagram TV. I first became aware that performance by social distance was going to become a thing by some of my favorite drag queen friends, Paul Swallow and Justin Vivian Bond, who almost immediately took to Instagram Live with little at-home videos that were funny, bitchy, campy. Stuck in his apartment in New York City, Paul sometimes appeared as his alter egos, Hollywood-style starlet Rebecca Havemeyer and Christine, the drug-addled genderbender from deep Louisiana. But he also showed up as plain old big-hearted Paul with his cat, Tickles Pickles. He is close friends with Viv, who fled to her upstate home, from where her diva persona, Auntie Glam, has been giving tutorials on Rona-themed cocktails in preparation for little Thursday evening soirees, where she sings a few thematically appropriate tunes, such as David Bowie's Space Oddity or Exuma's 21st Century. Just as V's performances as both Kiki and Justin Vivian Bond have saved me emotionally on numerous occasions, so too is Auntie Glam helping me survive the pandemic with both laughter and tears. Next, uh, on a daily basis, uh, Snatam Kaur's healing meditation on both Instagram TV and Facebook Live. Although many of my friends have been congregating for LA choreographer Ryan Heffington's sweat box, which is part disco party, part Zumba class, my version of a daily practice has been chanting with my Kundalini idol, Snatam Kaur, at 11 a.m. every morning. As many as a thousand people from around the world tune in to chant the healing mantra, Ramadasa Sase Sohang, for 11 minutes. We offer prayer for anyone who needs help, the sick and the frontline workers, of course, but also the anxious and depressed, the addicts, the undocumented and the refugees, those living alone, those living with too many others. I find it very useful to interrupt my work day, which continues unabated, even remotely, to give space to those who are on my mind, the elders and friends with cancer in my immediate circle, but also the people I don't know. One day it's the New Yorkers or the Texans, then it's the grocery store clerks and the delivery people. We also do a chant for the safe passage of the souls of the dead, both past and present, and I try to squeeze in a prayer in anticipation of those whose deaths I fear, especially my mother's. Then there's another little cluster that's um, April-ish around Easter time. So that would include on Good Friday, the um, rebroadcast of Jesus Christ Superstar from London via YouTube. There was also, this seems so long ago, um, Lady Gaga's One World Extravaganza uh, called At Home Together. Uh, also, on April 19th, I got to see Dorian Wood doing Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation live at home, um, at his home in Los Angeles. Um, and then on April 22nd, I was able to see one of the um, 
rebroadcasts of um, Toshi Regan's Parable of the Sower, um, which was alive at UCLA right as the pandemic hit in, um, in March. Uh, I'm clustering these together in order to indicate the broad spectrum of performance right now in terms of both scale and degrees of liveness. Lady Gaga's vision of global togetherness was a mixed bag, as variety shows are by definition. And it was also not very live, since most of the performers were pre-recorded from their homes. That was its own form of entertainment, as they stripped down to solo vocals and a lot of variations on accompanying keyboards. The appreciation for the healthcare workers was heartfelt, but frequently sentimental. Alicia Keys and Beyonce kept things on point by talking very bluntly about racial health disparities. More interesting to me have been the rebroadcasts of live shows that are hard to see even in mediated form. Standouts include the Good Friday streaming of the 2012 stadium rock version of Jesus Christ Superstar, not anywhere near as good as the classic film from the 1970s, but still a pleasure to watch both for the staging and for the vocals, including Scary Spice as Mary Magdalene. Even better for me was NYU Abu Dhabi's streaming of Toshi and Bernice Johnson Regan's opera version of Parable of the Sower in a one-time only feed. I've been longing to see this show, so access to it in any form was another so-called COVID silver lining. Apparently the Regans have performance rights, but not film rights, so circulation of the performance recordings is very carefully controlled. I was in the middle of another Earth Day live stream when I got word that it was on, so only saw the final songs, Toshi's rocked out version of God is Change, Change is God, and Bernice's finale rendition of the parable of the sower. Even in mediated form, it was incredible, maybe because the staging is minimal and the songs are so strong, and also because I've been thinking about the book a lot over these past months. The closest to an actual live show was Dorian Wood's performance of their cover version of Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation, which I was so sorry to miss at Outfest in Austin last year. It's a slow, dark, sad rendition of the songs, playing up the lyrics so as to underscore their political meanings and a good choice for the present moment. Dorian was alone in their house broadcasting live and the intimacy of his big body and big heart performing these songs was almost just as good as a live show. And then finally, um, uh, Instagram uh, DJ shows with Lynn T from Lesbians on Ecstasy and my own uh, Gretchen Phillips broadcasting from my house uh, with occasional cameos from yours truly as the backup dancer. Uh, and then also uh, Fire Circles with um, Lisa Vogel, uh, the uh, producer of the former Michigan Women's Music Festival. Let me close by circling back around to some of my home communities, the deep les world of Mishfest and my own home. Inspired by Lynn T from Lesies on X, Gretchen has been spinning tunes from her record collection for an hour a week, standing in front of her shelves and her turntable and talking to friends in between songs. Although at first I found it distracting to see the comment feed scrolling across the screen, I've come to appreciate that the romper room style capacity of Instagram to allow you to talk to your audience is a pretty cool way to socialize. A small number of audience members make it even easier to chat back and forth. On a broader scale, Mishfest producer Lisa Vogel has come out of retirement and the sometimes insular circles of women's music festivals to read her memoir in the making to an audience of up to 500 on Facebook every Sunday. There are ASL interpreters, um, her sidekick comedian Elvira Kirch to chat with between stories and a steady feed of comments from those watching, many of whom know each other and are using the occasion to connect. It's both live and mediated and rep replicates some of what is important about queer performance and its spaces as a way of building social and affective networks. Okay, that's it for that one. Um, and again, you can take time out to write about or list some of your um, Miss Rona performances that are of note. Um, I'm gonna pause for, um, or you can just spiral uh, or take a bathroom break. Um, I'm gonna pause and I will come back to you with my next installment. 
Hi folks, I'm back with um, installment number three, and this one dates from uh, June 3rd. So it was shortly after the death of George Floyd and the uprisings in um, many places across the US and also here in Canada. And um, the prompt for this one is, it's called Cultures of Protest, and the prompt was uh, my thinking back, especially because I was so limited in the places that I could go to just memories of um, a protest and of um, activism. So that would be something you might want to spiral and think about as I read. Okay. Call me a thrill seeker, but I wish I were on the streets right now. I'm reading other people's eyewitness reports. On the ground accounts are the only ones I trust right now because media coverage of protest is always terrible or inadequate, even when it's peaceful protest. In another of his long Facebook posts, Jim Ferrat, Stonewall and ACT UP veteran, frequent and sometimes infuriating provocateur, uh, wrote about how he heard people from his apartment in New York City and was drawn ineluctably into the crowd. He wore a mask, maintained social distance, and eventually got tired out, but as he put it, he had to march. And so do I. I almost don't care where, but if I could go anywhere, it would probably be New York. I happened to be there in September for the climate change march and wept a bit when I arrived downtown to an outpouring of kids with their amazing signs. It was crowded, but not claustrophobic. And I was also there last summer for Stonewall 50. Even though there were naysayers, I loved it. Not the big march, but the hopping between the transgender march and the drag march on Friday, the dyke march on Saturday, and then the counter march the next morning, just before and alongside the official march. I spent the weekend trying to figure out the relation between the queer 90s and the current moment, more so than reflecting on the events of 1969. I actually wrote something about the rally in Central Park and its relation to ACT UP, which I've been thinking about this past week, but because Larry Kramer was there for one last hurrah, but in my view, totally upstaged by the next generation of indigenous, disabled, trans, immigrant, and BIPOC activists. Although the queer 90s were still in full force in performances by Justin Vivian Bond, Marga Gomez, Kevin Aviance, and others. One difference uh, since Stonewall 25 is the centrality of anti-racism to queer organizing. We've come a long way in 25 years, but not far enough yet, as we are seeing now, in incendiary uprisings that are so different in mood from a celebratory march. I've been thinking about those moments when the adrenaline is running or the juice is in my system as my friend Lakin in Minneapolis wrote about the effect of having the National Guard on the streets there. I'm reminded of the feel of more small-scale protests like anti-apartheid actions at Cornell back in the 1980s when I was ready to get into it with the police just for trying to keep us to one lane of traffic in tiny Ithaca or the opening scene from the depression journals in which I sprained my ankle because I was so upset about seeing students arrested on campus just for making a shanty town. More recently at a gun free UT rally, I got really angry about the white dude counter protesters edging to the front of an otherwise pretty harmless rally on campus. I moved up close to one of them and asked him to please step back or leave, and I could feel the potential for violence in my veins. But I love the feel of an unruly, spontaneous march. The first dyke march in Washington, D.C. in 1993, the first queer bomb in Austin about 10 years ago, the night of Wendy Davis's filibuster for abortion rights at the state capitol in Austin, I've also been in New York City for rowdier moments, Zuccotti Park during Occupy, and at least one nighttime march against anti-Black racism where the streets felt a little edgy and tense. What would I do right now? Where would I be? I'm not sure, but I really wanna be on a street somewhere, especially after close to three months of sheltering at home in relative isolation. Even six feet apart from others, I wanna feel the energy of trying to change things the potent cocktail of grief and anger channeled into the movement of running in the streets. I confess that I'm a protest chaser. 
after the Stonewall 50 counter march, some of us weren't quite ready to go home. So we took the train from Central Park downtown to the West Village and stood at the historic corner of Christopher Street and 7th Avenue, across from the Stonewall Inn, watching an endless parade of corporate floats pressing on amidst the debris on the street. After about an hour, too tired to go to a club to dance, I walked home across the village where crowds of young queer black and brown kids were partying in the streets, making the space their own. I am glad to think they might be the future, and I hope this season of protest proves me right. Okay, that's also a little love letter to New York City where I so wish I could be in these hard times. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna pause there. Um, feel free to take a break in any way that works for you. Um, you might wanna lie down or stretch at this point. And, um, or you can write about uh, your version of protest cultures, your memories of protest or your current experiences. Okay, back soon. Okay, folks, here we are for our last, if you've stayed with me and um, we've had, uh, an episode from that was written April, May, June. So now we're in July for this last one. Um, I'm continuing to think about the uprisings um, around racism and um, kind of going back to Linda Berry's question about how did we get here, uh, thinking back to uh, my own experiences. So the prompt for this one is um, what's your earliest memory connected to Black feminism in any way? Um, and for me, I also found myself thinking back to the importance not only of the um, civil rights movements and other social movements of the 60s and 70s that were very formative for me as a child, because I've been around that long, but also the um, incredible um, ideas and thinking and people in the academy in the 80s and 90s that I think provides some of the foundations for what we are seeing now. Um, so this piece is about um, Alexis Pauline Gums and um, her partner Sean Godari's amazing Black Feminist Breathing Chorus, which I was privileged to be able to participate in early on in the pandemic. It's also um, part of my thinking about of uh, spiritual practices, performance, other ways in which we survive. Okay, so I decided to join the chorus in late April because I'm a longtime admirer of Alexis Pauline Gums' work, and I was doing other forms of daily meditation and felt that this would be another useful pandemic resource, especially, especially since I'd also been turning back to Black feminist work on collective care and the nexus of Octavia Butler's God is Change and Adrienne Marie Brown's activist work on pleasure and emotion. It has been interesting to see not only the cross-generational influence, but the transfer from literature and theory into activism as Audre Lorde and Octavia Butler become inspirations for, black, for contemporary Black Lives Matter organizing that, <clears throat> as Angela Davis pointed out in a recent talk, has feminism and queer politics at its core in a way that was not the case for civil rights and black power movements of the 1960s. The course consists of 21 days of mantra, each taken <clears throat> from an important black feminist figure, which is a generous tent that includes black gay men like Melvin Dixon and Joseph Beam and the trans feminist luminary, Marsha P. Johnson, whose pay it no mind is a mantra I have come to find very useful for my life as an administrator. It's also a primer in Black feminist history, taking us back through the abolitionist organizing of Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, the struggles against lynching by Ida B. Wells, and the Black intellectual work of Anna Julia Cooper, the writings of Gwendolyn Brooks, Zora Neale Hurston, and Lorraine Hansberry. There are important clusters around the civil rights movement, Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and Polly Murray, and as expected, a solid base in the Black lesbian feminisms of Audre Lorde, Pat Parker, June Jordan, and more. Alexis explains that she found it challenging to meditate in foreign languages that seemed appropriative, so wanted to develop homegrown mantras from her own ancestors. 
So we explore phrases such as Audre Lorde's, I am what I am, doing what I came to do, and Bayard Rustin's, the power of love is the, in the world is the greatest power existing. There were sometimes dissonant or uncomfortable moments for me as a white woman participating in a practice designed for black women, but I also found it a good way to be reverent towards black feminism, keeping in mind the mantra taken from the words of the Kambahi River Collective statement, black women are inherently valuable. Some ideas were very familiar, such as Octavia Butler's God is Change, and chanting those words 108 times was a great way to reflect on them. Some are like a black feminist version of chanting God's name as we do in the Kundalini tradition, such as June Jordan's love is life force. In the final week, we work with one mantra more closely and I chose Ella Baker, give light and people will find the way. I found it useful for my current path as an administrator, encouragement to just show up with what I have and trust to others. And it's good for white feminists to remember to let people find their own way. I, uh, just as a footnote, I thought it was so strange and interesting that um, Joe Biden opened um, his statement at the DNC with that um, same concept from Ella Baker. It was an honor to participate in the closing circle and to process our experience of the previous month by the light of May's full moon and with the surprise appearance of a double rainbow in Durham, where our hosts are located. In this gathering of the breathing chorus, I remember being newly struck by Polly Murray's free to be holy, every breath a prayer, and making a note to work on it further. And on the following Monday, George Floyd was killed and the, these resources became even more of a lifeline, a repository of wisdom for surviving hard times. The course started again a week later on the full moon of June 5th, with protests in full swing everywhere. And I decided to repeat it as a way to process, or in the words of Audre Lorde, to metabolize rage and grief and hope. Black women are inherently valuable, yes. Harriet Tubman's dream that my people are free the conviction that her dream is already a reality. Yes, the sweet prayer from Lorraine Hansberry, I impose beauty on my future. Yes, and the fierce words of Octavia Butler, God is change, now being circulated by Toshi and Bernice Johnson Regan's version of the parable of the sower in a beautiful intergenerational transfer from word to song. Yes, and the breath, I always returned to the breath, in addition to Polly Murray's Every Breath a Prayer, Melvin Dixon, who died of HIV AIDS in 1992, reaches across time to tell us, breathe in, breathe out, remember us. Breathe in, breathe out, remember us. Okay, that's it. Um, look forward to seeing what other people have to say in these little mini lectures and to gathering together in, um, I think it's on October 29th uh, in order to discuss further. Thank you. Bye.